I don't want to denigrate my profession, but no, there's a lot of <laughs> archaeologists who won't look beyond their, the site that they're digging. Let's put it that way. They're not interested in comparative studies, uh, which is one reason why they, they never could crack the Maya script because they, they never were, looked they at things in. comparatively. Yeah, you're, you're, um, you're talking about uh, uh, Thompson. And, yeah, yeah. For, <laughs> particularly. Let, let, let's, let's call names. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, yeah. Well, well, he, because yeah. he was in the, at a certain point and he was sure about what he had and he didn't yeah. want any discussion on it. Well, he didn't even want to look at it. I mean, that's the whole thing. That's, that's uh, anybody who talked about Trans-Pacific diffusion of any sort is labeled a crackpot. But it wasn't just that. He had a lot of other things. Well, like you were talking about the hieroglyphic writing. Yeah, we could he had that, a theory we could that, that well, was... Well, it shows what tunnel vision will do to hamper uh, the forwarding knowledge. Um, so I take his example as a good one? Because yeah. I did a lot of research yeah. on this in the last several years and wrote a paper for it. Uh, actually, it was published by Dumbarton Oaks in Washington. Why a, a Russian sitting in the Soviet Union under the worst repressive state that's been invented in recent history, who never had the chance to, to get outside of Russia at any point, never saw a Maya site, never met a Maya, never talked to a Maya. Why he cracked the Maya script and not Eric Thompson, who had every opportunity to, to see all this stuff, who was constantly in the Maya area, great expert on the Maya, why he couldn't crack the script? Why he, he just didn't do it? It's background and outlook. 100%. Background and outlook. You have to... Now, Khodorozov was probably not a dedicated Marxist, but say one thing for Marxism, Marxist scholarship, they do make you look at other cultures. There's no way you can get around it. You have to do things comparatively because he and Engels were comparative historians in a way. Uh, so they do look at things comparatively. They may get the wrong ideas out of it, uh, but they do look at other cultures. And uh, in the case of, so Knorazov had an incredibly good education in other cultures that had writing systems. He knew them all. He, he, he had studied Egyptian, how Egyptian hieroglyphic systems work. He studied Chinese. He studied Japanese, which happens to be the closest comparison you could make to, to the, the way the Maya system worked. He knew the Middle East, the cuneiform scripts, all these ancient writing systems he knew. And then he got the challenge from his professor, okay, you know all of this, now tell me why you can't decipher the Maya script. So he put his mind to it. Thompson, on the other hand, couldn't care less about other cultures. There, there were the Maya and there was nobody else. If you look at his book on Maya hieroglyphic writing, it's that thick. It's what's called a ladrillo in Spanish. It's got a, a bibliography of more than 500 items in it. There's not one mention of another culture. There's not one mention of another writing system. It's just irrelevant. It had nothing to do with his, his beloved Maya. It's all, you just had to, to study the Maya and that was it. He knew a little bit, a bit about the classics. Because I went into his education. I actually got his transcripts from his, <laughs> you know, from his old school and, I, and from, and from uh, Cambridge University. He only attended Cambridge one year and never learned any real anthropology there. So he had no, he didn't have the background for this, none. But, but the, the Russian was a linguist. He was and he was a linguist. He yeah. was a trained linguist. Now, too. Well, uh, Thompson uh, hated linguistics. Yeah. He loathed linguists. But that's the key, obviously, to decipher. I know it. The la it's a language. You it's have to language. go in through the language. So, uh, to me, it's no surprise that a guy sitting in Soviet Russia, when Konorozov did, at a young age, published in 1952 the Breakthrough Article. And uh, it's no surprise that Thompson fought against that all the rest of his life. Yeah, but but th th this is new to me. I, I didn't know that, that he had studied all these other languages. Oh, yeah. Uh, w which now makes more sense. Because if you look at it th the way it's uh, I simplistically explained, oh, there's this Russian, and he was fanatical about it, and he came up with uh, deciphering the Mayan hieroglyphics. 
Well, it's a lot more complex than that from what oh, you're it's saying. Much more uh, well, it's if he's if he educational if he was comparing other other languages, Constantly. finding patterns of how yeah, the exactly. human mind uh, develops a writing system, yeah. of course that's going to be a lot more easier for this Russian than yeah. than than Thompson to f to yeah. decipher. In, in, in fact, it, it, it's inevitable that Morozov would have done it once he had. Uh, decided to study the Maya. Inevitable. He was, he was pre-adapted to this, uh, as the <laughs> biologist would say. He was ready for it, uh, mm. no doubt about it. Thompson never was. Thompson just, th that was irrelevant. And if you haven't got uh, a comparative approach to the study of ancient civilizations, you're not going to learn anything, even about the thing that you're studying. And that's kind of what we're doing with, with our studies. We're saying, well, it's not just about looking at us our history, well, how, how did, well, like we used the, the Jewish example, well, wait a minute, how did the Jews develop themselves, whether you're talking about when they were in Babylonian exile and they create the Bible, or how do they survive all these thousands of years, uh, how do they recreate a state, forget the Palestinian injustice for a second, yes. but that, that they're able to bring up a dead language and, and make it a living yeah, language. Yeah, or you look at in terms of China yeah. and how it became a nation. Uh, there's a lot to be learned there. Or you can even look in terms of Africa and uh, Nkrumah and he says, what independence? You guys control the port, you guys control the, the writing, the, the education system, yeah. you guys control the prices. We don't have any independence and we know what happened in Nkrumah. So in comparing, in comparing uh, it, I think it, it is very fruitful. And that's what, like that's with the only approach. Yeah, and that's what we're doing. We're saying, uh, get out of this mestizo mentality. Yes. Get get out of this Eurocentric mentality. Get out of this Vasconcelos mentality. Get out of this Christian mentality. Yeah. Uh, and start looking into the morality, the the history. Yeah. Yeah. How did other people deal with the same problem? Yes. You look at even the Spaniards themselves. They were, they were uh, an op oppressed by uh, a Muslim Arabic people for 800 years, right. and little by little they found solution to, well, they found military solution. Yeah, right. um, and obviously in these kind of days, uh, again, uh, communications as a solution, education as a solution, talking uh, the moral issues behind all of this, and comparing and telling people, well, first of all, you're not who you say you are, and we're not who you say we are. Yeah. You did not invent agriculture or the wheel. Yeah. You, uh, you actually brought down civilizations with the Germanic tribes. And be aware, it was smallpox that was the secret of yeah. European success around the world. And you can add slavery to that, and you can add massacres and lying and... Uh, what is it? Kidnapping, extortion, <laughs> piracy, yes. raping, and yeah. all the rest, and uh, not acknowledging the people's right to their land or the minerals on their land or their ownership. Yeah. Uh, and then you can have a real, real discussion with, with uh, the the moral, decent people of all the different races involved, because the problem we have a lot of times the bigger problem is really our own people who are so Eurocentric themselves, and they accept all that. So, and they accept all that. And, uh, so I, I like what you're saying about comparing, you got, you got to take oh, a comparative you approach. Know what got me into this. You mentioned the uh, Christianity. I went to a, a church school run by the Episcopalian Church, and uh, yeah, you know, chapel every Sunday, uh, 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 twice. Because the daily chapel, and then on Sunday there'd be evening chapel, and uh, sacred studies that you had to take in class. That was all part of it. The the head of the school was a was a, an Episcopalian minister, so I got a real Christian education. And believe it or not, uh, in sacred studies, it kind of interested me because <laughs> interesting stuff. Uh, I won a prize, <laughs> and the prize was a book called The Book of a Thousand Tongues, put out by the American Bible Society, and uh, uh, 
in it you found all the languages of the world and a sort of a thumbnail description of who they were and sort of little thing, sort of like a short Wikipedia entry on all, all these, these different people, plus examples of uh, their writing system. And what it would be would be uh, the first part of the Book of St. Mark, which is the easiest one to translate, I gather, of all the books in the Bible. Uh, the first, say, two or three verses of it in that particular language, in that system that they use. I looked at this. I, it was a, one of the best books I've ever got. And it got me interested in other cultures. I think I had my first glimmerings about what anthropology was through this thing, you know, put out by the American Bible Society. Of course, they're out to, you know, brainwash and convert all these people. But it was a method that you found But But still, you have these these things that nobody ever told me about in other places. So I've always been interested in writing systems because of that, that book that, and, that, that, and in other people's. Because yeah. that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, but it sounds like that's the root of your curiosities. It got me fired up on these things. <laughs> I was always interested in this kind of stuff. And right when I got into my studies as an undergraduate and decided to stop being an English major, uh, I got I got hooked on that writing system. Why hasn't anybody cracked it? You know, I mean, you know, they they can read the calendar stuff over a hundred years ago. Everybody could read that. Uh, that was well known. Uh, uh, the number system and even the astronomy was, was well known when astronomers got into it, like the eclipse tables. But what about all the rest of the stuff? I mean. <laughs> that followed the date. What follows the date, you know? And I could not believe at that point that uh, any ancient civilization was just interested in writing down dates for no apparent reason, which is what Thompson and all the others oh, tried to that, make that us was think. The, oh, the rest is just ornaments. Yeah, ornaments, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, who knows what it is, you know. Just, and uh, it turned out that uh, Thompson was 100% wrong. I started to write uh, articles about all of these things when I was uh, a beginning graduate student. And I had the nerve to publish an attack on Thompson back then. Not about the nature of the writing system, but about he poo-pooed the idea that uh, the Olmec could have had any kind of knowledge of calendars and things of that sort. And I think I proved him wrong. I know I proved him wrong in <laughs> retrospect. So uh, I, you did prove uh, him wrong. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I respected Thompson. I, a guy who knew an awful lot, but I didn't count out to him. I can't count to uh, I can't count out to anybody. I mean, obviously, he got his reputation at one point, but it seems he got to a certain point and then didn't, didn't progress. Anymore. He didn't progress, and he scared off everybody. You know, because he had all these facts. Uh, at his fingertips, he, he really like, he did. Was, uh, the, the but king, he, king of Mayan uh, the, king, the emperor. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, emperor. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't cross this guy up, you know. I knew him quite well. I mean, and we were survived. friends. Yeah, I survived. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why not? Luckily, he had nothing to do with uh, any kind of academic appointment. He was never a professor. He never taught. Mm -hmm. Never taught. And that showed, too. Because if he had had students... Uh, you know, to question him all the time, who dared question him, he might have, you know, changed his views and looked or more broadly at, at, at important things. He had no use for anthropologists. He had no use for linguists. They were just, you know, you studied the Maya and that was it. And uh, I think that hampered him and what he was. He, you know, he, he did make some breakthroughs, but not about how to read Maya hieroglyphs.
<laughs> well, you, 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 I think you've answered what got you interested in in archaeology, I guess, uh, and yeah, anthropology. Right. But what, what got you specifically interested in, in Mesoamerica. Mesoamerican studies? Well, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, starting out, the whole idea was that I, 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 I wanted to be a writer. And uh, I wanted to, I would have liked to have taken a course when I got in there uh, and became an English major in creative writing. Well, I went to the wrong university. Uh, Harvard had no course in creative writing in those days. It was all kind of, you memorized uh, uh, passages, the, uh, tested on spot passages. They'd give you at all times, who wrote this? Was it Alexander Pope or somebody else? Uh, and uh, literary criticism, which was deadly. And I got less and less and less interested in that. There were plenty of other places that had great writing courses. I mean, Yale had a f fantastic one. Indiana had a great one. I should have gone to some other place, but instead of which I went to Harvard. But I'm glad I did go to Harvard, because when I decided to change my, my major, Harvard was a top place to study anthropology and Mesoamerica. There's no doubt about it. It had the greatest library on the subject. But what got me really interested, out of probably boredom more than anything else, I started to get out of the Widener Library books on, on the Maya. I don't know what got me hooked on this. And they were terrible books. All of them were trash books. But I didn't know any different. I mean, these guys could write on anything and I'd swallowed it, you know, great explorers. And now I, most people never heard of these people. But uh, I decided I wanted to go to Yucatan someday. And I had the chance. My, my parents used to go every Christmas Time around there to, to Cuba, you know, the pre Castro Cuba. And so I went and I got very bored with, uh, believe it or not, with Havana after a while. And it's just a short hop from Havana to Merida. And propeller planes, but you went, the, you got on them at El Rancho Boyeros there and, and hopped over to Yucatan. And I spent, uh, uh, during Christmas vacation, I spent a week and a half at Chichen Itza. A week and a half. And I thought that was well, the greatest you, thing. What I'd, year was that? 1940, I don't know, like, I don't know, 50, about 1947 to 48, 47. that winter. Chichen Itza. That was a long time ago. And uh, I thought this was fabulous. You know, what a place this was. And luckily, Morley's book had just come out. The Ancient Maya, the first edition. Still a wonderful book, it's full of enthusiasm. Morley was really a, a, a terrific guy. You liked him better. <laughs> I liked him a lot. And I never knew him, but I mean, I had this book. Still got the first edition. Uh, it's just a, a wonderful book. And uh, so I, I got really all fired up. And I, I remember uh, uh, at uh, Chichen, out of the... Uh, old Chichen, which has got some inscriptions out of there that, you know, around 800 A.D. or so, eight to 900 A.D. on the little, there was a, some guy who claimed he was a cameraman from Hollywood. <laughs> I remember this guy, very nice guy. And he was running his hand over the glyphs and, and reading them. I thought, oh man, <laughs> am I lucky to be with him. <laughs> because I later found out the guy invented the whole thing. He made it all up. He couldn't read one hieroglyph from the next. Uh, but uh, at any rate, I was, I, by that time I said, I'm going back to Harvard. I'm dropping English and I'm going to find out how I can major in Maya archaeology. <laughs> Of course, there, was, there isn't any major in my archaeology. I'd have to do uh, anthropology. And uh, I'd read, you know, Sir James Fraser, loved his stuff, the Golden Bough and whatnot. I knew some anthropology. I said, that sounds neat. Uh, why not do that? You know, you'll have to study the Maya through an anthropology course. So then I was sent uh, to, the, to the Peabody Museum there, where the grand old man of Maya studies was. Alfred Marston Tazer, uh, who had just put out the great edition of Bishop London, you know, uh, the, you know, which was the Bible for studying the Maya. And I was, he had just retired, this is uh, his, he was just retired. And uh, he turned out to be a wonderful guy. And uh, 
he, I guess, figured out that I was really serious about becoming a Mayanist at this point. And then he, he asked me, uh, well, what kind of grades are you getting? Uh oh. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> not too good. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, Well, I want to tell you something. I said, If you intend to become, you know, a Mayanist or a Mesoamericanist, they didn't use Mesoamerica in those days, uh, study Middle America, he said, uh, you're going to have to do this. First of all, you're going to have to take nothing but anthropology from now on. Uh, secondly, you're going to have to get honors grades in all these courses, and why not? And thirdly, you're going to have to qualify and be, get good enough grades so that you can get into graduate school because you're going to have to have a PhD. Otherwise, you're nothing. Well, it was all good. It was, he read me the riot act. It scared you, huh? Oh, man. And I had, uh, at that point, a bunch of roommates who had no intention of letting me study. I had to turn into a grind. Whew. And I, I got <laughs> migraine headaches and everything, but I did. You, you know, I've never worked so hard in my life for the next for the next two years. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> no, I mean that was the best advice I was ever given by anybody. I mean, he just told it the way it was. There's no way you can do this unless you did that. That was that. Well, it was basically saying this, <laughs> changed this, my this life. Is, this is serious. And, yeah, and it, it changed for, my life. It definitely. It, it, yeah. It worked for you, and I have no helped, regrets. Helped, helped uh, <laughs> with all. Of and Tazer was a wonderful guy, a wonderful uh, uh, scholar, and uh, he he was on to getting somebody to discover how the Maya writing system worked, uh, and he was completely open to phonetic explanations. That there was a lot of phoneticism, which there is, uh, was it, and because of Landa. That's because of Landa, he knew yeah. Landa well. He also, he had a comparative approach. He knew a lot about other civilizations. But he never did it himself. He never wanted to do it himself. But he wanted to have somebody who was interested in this. So uh, this was, a, this was a, a totally different world that I walked into then. So that's how I got, got into this field. Yeah, right, right now that that's being mentioned, um, I wanted to, uh, in terms of the, the Mayan, you, uh, you 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 worked on the the, um, the PBS thing, uh, cracking right. cracking cracking the Maya yeah, code. Yeah, they they, uh, 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 they decided they they didn't want breaking the breaking. Maya code, <laughs> which is what the name of my book was. Uh, but and uh, they cut the film the complete film down by half, uh, you know, so we could uh, be thinking that audiences would get bored. Actually, the complete film which put out by Nightfire Films is really terrific. Yeah, DVD, we, we got yeah. it, but it, it doesn't look like there's that much missing. I, I think they, it, well, I'll tell you what was missing. They don't have anything on the Landa alphabet, the so-called alphabet, but, which is a, actually the Rosetta okay. Stone of oh, the whole on, thing. On the, on the edit? Yeah, the, I mean, that's what Conor, oh, oh, got yeah. Conorozov off yeah. to what he did. Yeah, because that, that's a little bit of where I was going yeah. to get to. Otherwise, it was a good job, yeah. actually. And I liked the kind of sidebars in that PBS yeah. version. They had, you know, they had uh, uh, Barbara McLeod, who I know well from Catch, <laughs> the amazing person, reciting in Maya, uh, sitting in front of an inscription, in the proper Maya, which is, should be Chalti Maya. That's, that's the Maya language that it's in. Actually going through the whole thing. Uh, which is terrific. And, you know, Barbara, by profession, is a stunt pilot. <laughs> uh, she was actually out in Merced with us. You probably met oh, the, her. The, the lady from uh, Santa Barbara? Uh, no, that's another one. Oh, okay. uh, that's another Barbara. Oh, okay. <laughs> Barbara okay. Borey's student of mine. Yeah. No, Barbara, the other Barbara was there. But she's a professional stunt pilot. <laughs> and what not. All kind, there's all kinds of interesting people in this subject now. Yeah, I guess from watching the video, and I did get the DVD, the, the full version yeah. also, and, but watching it, I was saying, well, you know, because we talk about, in terms of the future, we, 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 we start thinking, well, not just the next 20 years, yeah. the 50, 50 years, yes. uh, but then we lose other people because we talk about, well, well how about in, in, uh, in the year 21, and the year 2200, 
where will we be? How will we reconstruct ourselves? Okay, uh, okay, the the Mayan numeral system. Okay, that that one's pretty easy. Well, that's been known. Yeah, that's been known no, since about 1830. No, but in terms of using it, it it's yeah. it's pretty easy. Uh, yeah. Uh, but the writing system, because it's funny you were talking about the Japanese. I remember this guy was. Uh, I used to be a film editor, and this other guy uh, across from me, he had it, his film editing room. He was studying Japanese, and what he was doing, he was putting it all on his walls to memorize the yeah. writing system, because yeah. he said, "Well, th this is the hardest part." Because he was going, he had a Japanese girlfriend, and he yeah. was going, he was going to go. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he had this whole other career he wanted to go to, but when he was explaining to me about learning the Japanese writing system, right. and it just Wow, it must be love because that, <laughs> that sounds. Well, that I'll <laughs> you, little children learn it. Yeah, um, you know everybody says oh, to have a writing system. This applies to the Maya. Uh, to have a writing system that complicated. It's the most complex writing system in the in the world today. That's in you know general use. It's Japanese. And it's actually in principle uh, how it operates. It's exactly the same as Maya. You have semantic, uh, what are called kanji. The, 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 the Chinese derived, uh, uh, we call them logograms. Mm -hmm. And then you have the phonetic stuff, which is a syllabary, which is kana. Mm -hmm. And uh, Japanese puts those two things together to make a complete writing. The Maya did exactly the same thing. They but have, it, they have logograms and they have this syllabary that Lanigan. So there is an equivalent of a, of a kanji. With, uh, the yes, line. yes. The, 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 we call the general term is logograms. They stand for whole words or roots of words, yeah. rather than just uh, a, a phonetic sound. Yeah. Uh, and the way the, the ways that this thing works are sound complex, but they're not. They can you say if you've got a, a kanji uh, a, a term, or let's say you have. Uh, in Maya, let's call it a logogram. Uh, how is this pronounced? Very often, the scribe, the guy writing it, will take a syllab syllable or a group of syllables from the syllabic system and stick it on to as an adjunct to that particular thing. So it will help you. It'll kick your your your, your kick you into knowing exactly what this word is. And Japanese works the same way. Japanese is a, is a mixture of phonetic and semantic terms. And that's exactly what Maya is. A okay, little side note on this same subject. The one that doesn't, there's a lot of other puzzles, but one is obviously the, the Maya and the, and the Mexica were able to exchange. And, and yeah. why did the Mexica not adapt the Mayan hieroglyphic Writing, which was obviously much yeah. a better system, yeah, and why didn't they sense. why didn't they use a, what, what's called Mayan numeral system, which is what more realistically all might. Well, you do find it's not a hundred percent exclusionary little... because they were. I think they were influenced by the Maya heavily, and they the, some of the Mexica were using bar and dot numeration, which is you know the bars for five and the dots for one. Uh, that so, appears but, in the codices. But you don't see that much. You don't see that much. Often yeah. it just yeah, comes I, out of so yeah, many dots. Yeah, because I look curious because you do see it occasionally, but yeah. not consistently. That's right. But they knew about the Maya system, well, and they, I they think respect They had to know it. Well, they, they talk trading. about, uh, they you know. They trading with the area. Uh, they talk about the land of the, of the red and the black, or the black and the red. What is that? That's Yucatan. That's a Maya area to them. And why do they call it that? Because that's the way Maya writing, it's either in black or it's in red or in both. That's what the scribes use. The, it's a land of writing. is what And I think they, they, they respected it. I think the Maya were the super sabios for these people. Yeah. They really were. Yeah. Uh, but they, their writing system is, is, is more complex than, than we've made out, even I've made out in the book Mexico. Yeah. Uh, well, Lacadena is onto something here, but it's not complete. The Maya could write anything in their language, mm -hmm. totally, uh, with no problem. The other thing is about the difficulty of Maya. It's been overstressed, uh, and I take Japanese as a good example. Um, they said people say, "Oh, there couldn't have been just a tiny, tiny fraction 
of the Maya who could actually read this stuff. I said, well, how do you know? Uh, well, they said the writing system is so complicated. I said, it's no different than Japanese. And the Japanese uh, literacy, I think, is something like 98% among adult Japanese. Now, come on. <laughs> the, the difficulty of the writing system has nothing whatsoever to do with literacy. Now that reminds me of a, st a story somebody was saying about this English woman that went to China and she saw a little four-year-old four little kid talking in Chinese, Chinese and, and said, how clever. Look at this little boy. <laughs> talk, talk, it must be it's such a difficult language. And this four-year-old child here is speaking this Chinese language. And it, it, it kind of it's comes, the it, it's right. the same thing. If yeah. you're raised in it, uh, or I use the example of if you're raised in a, in a home where your mom and your dad are doctors. Yeah. And you're hearing them talking yeah, every day. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I, they're, they're using you know twenty dollar words at you know three years yeah, three know. years old, and yeah. and that kid can't possibly understand that word. <laughs> and they do understand it because they hear it every day in the language of the parents, uh, and, and especially say they're both surgeons and they, and they talk about things yeah. in, in that way. Yeah. It's a very natural thing. And you know, uh, uh, Maya is a. Is a difficult language. The grammar is different. Now, Watl is is really logical, and I think I won't say it's easy, but it's 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 very. I think it's easy to learn. It actually is, but uh, there are really difficult languages in the New World. Uh, Navajo is one of them. Uh, that's a really tough one, and upstate New York, Oneida, and some of those Iroquoian languages are the most com difficult languages on earth, and. Little kids, <laughs> the little four-year-old you're talking about, yeah. they pick it up like that. Yeah, yeah, because well, especially if they grew up in an area that that's all they had. Yeah. That, that they either either use that for communication or you don't communicate, right? I think a lot of the Maya were were literate back in the classic. I really do think so. Yeah, it, it sounds like it. It's kind of like a, I I use an example sometimes um, uh, about uh, writing systems. Uh, like you go to the handicap sign. Okay, yeah. the handicap sign shows a guy in a wheelchair, sort of a guy, could be a gal. It's yeah. a little hard to tell. Yeah. But we all understand what that means. Yeah, exactly. But if somebody came from another culture that had never seen that and said, well, that must be a place where they put the wheelchairs, yeah. the wheelchair people. Oh, no. um, and how would they ever make out that circle with a flash through it? Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> That's uh, uh, an important uh, thing. But, but there's a lot being said by that handicap sign. We all understand. We understand the fines involved. Yeah. We understand the, the the rudeness of trying to park there, even if you That's have the right. money. We we understand that it doesn't person doesn't have to come out in a wheelchair. Yeah. They they don't have to have a cane. They could have other issues going on. Yeah. Yeah. There are things that are understood, right, right. and that's what I'm I'm seeing in terms of a. Uh, a lot of cultural things of the Maya that were under things that were understood that weren't necessarily even written down. Yeah. Which you can say really about all cultures yeah. in a sense. Yeah. And how how is it that you you can I guess well, I don't know if you interpolate or extrapolate to, to try to understand a little bit more of the those kind of things. You know, there's so much missing when we talk about the ancient Maya. That's why going to Bali. <laughs> makes me think about these things. Uh, about, this would have been a couple of weeks ago, uh, my friend and guide, Buddy, told us that, you know, there's a, right around the, in the outskirts of this particular town, Ubud, there's a, uh, a ceremony that's going to take place in two days that uh, is given every 50 years. Are we interested in going? <laughs> and, there uh, in Bali, uh, they're so open and nice in Bali. If you wear, I had, everybody had to put a sarong on and a, and a, and a, and a sash, uh, uh, which we carried with us to get into these things. Uh, if you dress properly and act respectful, you can go into all, all these ceremonies. Not like the Mormon church, you can't go into the temple. Uh, it's, it's absolutely open. And just behave yourself, that's all, respect them. And we saw this amazing 52-year ceremony. We were right in the middle of it with thousands of people involved in it. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just, 
with theatrical masks, theatrical performances going on, gamelan music on, on all sides. And I took some, I mean, I hope these <laughs> come out, these photographs, which I have with me. We saw stuff like that, that uh, you suddenly think, we, you, we don't know what it was like, understand what it was like, the, the magnificence of what went on probably almost every day inside a Maya site like that. We know something of this from for the, for the Mexica, for the Aztec, thanks to the Sahagun and people like that. We know, you know what, what, they were, what they were like, but we know nothing about this for the Maya. And we look at these cities as empty, you know, a couple of priests wandering around. Take a look at, at Bali today. All these people, they're dressed in white with white head cloth, and uh, there are multiple priests, uh, Brahmin priests, uh, burning incense and praying, and the gamelan's going, theatrical performance here. You can have night, night dances. Then we, we went to one that... Uh, uh, incredible thing, which is a battle of good versus evil, which goes on every 260, every, sorry, 210, 210. days uh, uh, for every temple. There's something like 20,000 temples in Bali, so there's always one going on. And they pit there this, this, this uh, creature, which is part lion and part, part dragon, uh, which is good, against an evil old woman. Uh, Called Randa with big fangs and long fingernails. This goes on everywhere, all the time. And the young men of the village uh, c come out and try to fight Randa with their swords and they try to kill her. And she turns magically the sword against each one of these people. And she and the, the, the dragon lion called Barong and all the participants are in trance. Total trance. They're, they're completely in trance. And they're going like this, trying to kill themselves as she turns the swords again. I, I was as close to them as I am to your crew here. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. I, I thought, my God, if we only saw what the Maya did now. And I've, I had people on that tour said the same thing to me you know, who knew the Maya. Yeah, it, it just ties into Duran. Okay, the, the Rituals and Ceremonies book. Uh, I know, um, when, when, I, when I went yeah. through that book, I'm saying, so much detail. I know. I'm going, uh, which in there I saw the thing about the piñatas, basically. Yeah. I said, well, that's the origin of the piñatas, you <laughs> know? Good. You can yeah. see that. Yeah. Uh, I love the part, we're talking about how the corn, uh, popcorn necklaces. The popcorn necklaces. The popcorn yes. necklaces, because we've, right. uh, we've talked about how these are the, the kind of things that we should revive, you know, yeah. and, and, and basically re, 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 repossess the piñata and the quinceañera uh, thing and basically put it back to its origin. Well, what's, your, what's your take on Duran? I know Duran has the, the St. Thomas thing going know, on. He's got an agenda, too. Yeah, he's got an agenda. And, uh, but the, the, for me, the, when I first read it, um, I'm going, well, man, that's got a lot of screwy stuff going on here. But that's way too much detail. How, how did he get so much detail? on so many ritual, rituals and ceremonies and everything about going to go get the, the tree and, and yeah. all, all, all this detail. Well, what's, what's your take on Duran? Well, he had, uh, he, he had very good informants, I think. I mean, I don't think he got that detail under duress, like, you know, threatening uh, these people with torture or something worse. Well, he went uh, there as a kid, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Well, he was a, he was a criollo, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So he knew, it, he knew a lot of it as a, as a child. Well, actually, he was been in Sulat because I think he was born in Spain and was taken there. Taken as, there as a kid, as a kid. yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Um, Sahagun, we know who his, I mean, his informants were, were, were the nobility and the, the high-ranking priesthood yeah. and and the and, and the children of, of, of these people who he was sort of teaching in, in Tlatelolco and whatnot, uh, both of them had obviously 
their informants opened up to them about it. You know, a place where they deliberately got rid of their uh, Spanish overlay and went back and stayed with the original. Of course, the Pueblos, after the great Pueblo oh, revolt, right. the uh, they're very successful at doing that. And made a treaty in effect to say, yeah. stay out of yeah. our affairs. I've been twice to the uh, Santo Domingo corn dance in Santo Domingo, where when I last went, 400 uh, young men and women were dancing in that particular one. And the two kivas on both sides, uh, going in and out of these kivas uh, constantly, and a very nervous Catholic priest <laughs> standing there, because it's the day of St. Dominic, of course. Uh, I mean, he was definitely shoved off to one side uh, deliberately. And they went back and stayed true to their roots. You know, the, the Hopi and the Zuni and the, 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 the Rio Grande Pueblo people. Uh, some give, giving in here and there I'll without any question. Yeah, I mean, Akama, you know, has got that beautiful church up there. But you look inside the church, and there's a lot pre-Columbian in there. Yeah. Well, but it gets into the thing about who's fooling who, uh, in terms of, say, the, the Concheros and Matachines. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and when you read in turn, well, what were the early Christian churches like? Yeah. Which, in effect, had the four directions <laughs> go, go, going yeah. on. In there, and then when some of the priests say, "Hey, wait a minute, we're supposed to be tricking them. They're tricking us." Yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. so a lot, a lot, of, a lot, of, a lot of things happened over, over the centuries, um, where that's why when I when I well, first the, the Pueblos did that. They sort of took the Spanish Catholicism and it encapsulated it. You know, didn't try to completely destroyed, although they kicked a lot mm. of Spaniards out of there. Uh, but if they had to keep it, they, they sort, of, sort of had it off by itself, so the rest of their culture could go on full blast. Yeah, which they're able to do basically, you were saying, more, more so because the, the, the isolation, I think, is part of it. But in general, like people talk, well, we're still hanging on to our traditions, and they talk about the quinceañera, and they talk about the, yeah, the piñatas, right. and they talk yeah. about the padrinos, which is not yeah. exactly the way the Spaniards do it. We, yeah. we do it in, in a, this whole, more carrying on our traditions uh, yeah. from before. Um, but in the end, we really have lost the core of it, which is what, what we talk about is the warrior societies. Yeah. The warrior societies, which regulate it, the, the rituals and ceremonies, whether it were puberty rites or birth rites or death rites, or yeah. keeping the discipline, yeah. all of these different things, we don't have that, and neither do any any tribal areas. That's true. And so when people talk about, well, we got the dances, but that's not the heart, the core oh, no. of a culture. And then you look at Guatemala, for instance, at the, uh, um, you know, with the marimbas going and the various... Uh, uh, the dance of the conquista and things of that sort. You know, it's always the Spaniards who win those things, you know, <laughs> to deliver it. But uh, it's been so warped that uh, Maya, uh, Maya ritual, I think, has really suffered tremendously. As I say, going to Bali makes me see what's been lost. Because I've seen documentaries on Bali, and, and even from oh. the documentaries I've seen, it looks like they've been able to hang on to the core of it because they well, one they have their priesthood yeah okay they do and and, and none of it, it's like yeah. people say oh well that was a mayan priest and went well it's not the same these people bali is surrounded mm. with by islamic society mm. java is just a few miles off to the west and lombok a couple of miles to the east all that's muslim and an bali island has mm -hmm. stayed you know, its own variety of Hinduism. Uh, I was, yeah, in, in an island yeah. of Hinduism. <laughs> an island of Hinduism. Yeah. It's, it's such a rich culture that they manage to, you know, mm. hold everybody off and keep mm. their own soul. Mm. If I can go back to Duran, because people talk about Sagun, the few, the few who do, <laughs> yeah. uh, who talk about the, the culture. They, uh, which is, I mean, it's a, uh, we have a copy of, uh, um, we have actually, we have two copies. Uh, Neliolo actually has a, another, of uh, the Florentine complete set. Yeah. Um, and actually we got replicas of uh, the majority of the codices, yeah. be besides the, the Borgia and the Nutal, you know, the, that's What's more. What's great about Sahagun, as it, 
opposed to Duran is great, but Zahar Kuhn, you have the Nahuatl original. You know, yeah. In Nahuatl. W which I can, I, I, I value the Sagun, but to get back to, like I said, the, the, um, the details, although the Sagun actually brings in quite a lot oh, of detail yeah. too. There's a lot of stuff in, yeah. in Duran that is not in Zahar Kuhn. That, that's, that's, yeah. the, that's what I'm getting, that's what I'm, yeah. when I get at. That, that it, with Duran, he does get into the specific days, uh, the, the way they were dressed, what yeah. is it that they did at a certain point. Uh, like I remember the thing about the tray, because it, it, somebody makes a note about it, well this is like the ma maypole thing, yeah. you know. And I said, well not exactly. <laughs> but then you can see the, the whole pole thing, you can see that in a lot of cultures, whether yeah. it's a totem pole or whatever. Yeah, Again, right. one of those human things, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, from what you've read, what, what, what is the background? Because uh, how many books are there on Sagun about how he went through the process? There's, there's a, I, I have in my position about seven books yeah. just on, on Sagun. Right. Okay. There's not all that much on Duran. The, yeah. the, the, the great person on Duran was, and uh, well, a bunch of people who all worked together, all close friends in Mexico City, Doris Hayden, uh, 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 Fernando Orcasitas, did you ever? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting guy. I knew him. No, he no was, I've never met him, but I've seen him. He was an amazing guy. Mm -hmm. but, uh, really, really something. Uh, Ignacio Bernal, and these were all friends, and they were big Duran experts. People and, from 50s and, and 60s. Yeah, and yeah. they put out all these books, what we do have on Duran, and then not many other people uh, ever wrote much about him. Orcasitas was amazing, though. Um, he spoke fluent Nahuatl. He spoke fluent Yucatec Maya. And uh, I ran across him once in the bar of the Majestic Hotel in <laughs> downtown Mexico City. And he was pretty tomado at that <laughs> point. But uh, I, I said, I'd never, do, do the Maya swear, you know? And one, he said, you want to hear something? <laughs> he gave me a complete chorus in filthy Maya speech and Maya swear words, Lydia which he knew backwards. <laughs> but he was, a, he was an amazing guy. He was sort of a ne'er-do-well from a rich family. And uh, a genius. He taught in Mexico City College uh, for a while. His, his English was absolutely perfect. Uh, uh, and he was always interested in the you know, different sides of Mesoamerica. He was a, an original. I think he was related to Ignacio Bernal, so he moved in upper circles. But he, he was a big Duran enthusiast. And, and, and he's the, the, the one that you can think of. That, yeah, that, he, and, he and Hayden the put out the translations into English of that. Yeah, because I know there's a good introduction to the, to the book, which it just came out in paperback again, yeah. I think, last few years. Right. Um, but it's, uh, I've been curious uh, about that. So yeah. So much detail, because I, I want to use it as a source for a lot of different things. Yeah, you're right to use them as a source. Yeah. And why not? And he wanted to, he, he made no bones about wanting to extirpate what remained of the religion. I mean, that's quite clear. Well, well, but but was, so did Sahagun. That was going mean. to say, that was the agenda of Sahagun. Too. That's a quite right. People but, forget that. Yeah. But it, you kind of sense with Sahagun, it's like, okay, I've been given this assignment. He, he follows through with the assignment. and. Of course, the, the law of 1577, destroy all, blah, 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 yeah. which is also, you don't hear people talk about that. Phil, Phil uh, the second saying, in effect, hey, they're just our subjects, Des destroy whatever they've written, destroy whatever we've written. Yes. Yeah. Well, and Philip the second uh, they wanted everything destroyed mm -hmm. when he heard about, you know, what Sahagun had done, that's got to go. Never let it be released. So was it a direct relation to Sahagun, or was it just in general, we want these Indians? It, it was Sahagun, uh, you know, if it had been shipped back to, to Spain. Mm -hmm. and of course, it's now in Italy, but uh, the, uh, uh, somebody told him about this amazing thing. It was the Primeros Memoriales, maybe? Primer, it would have been the Primeros Memoriales. That's exactly yeah. what it was. Mm -hmm. And he said, no. <laughs> mm. uh, that can't be. That, ca that can't be ever diffused to any. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and and the, 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 the irony is he was mostly successful because it wasn't seen for 300 years. That's correct. Yeah, and then yeah. most Mexicans know nothing about it. Yeah, I know uh, it's like here, I, we, uh, our, our internal problems here is Chicano studies, which we talked yeah. a little bit. I have talked with Chicano studies, there is only one who actually has read it. Yeah. The majority of them said, these, these are full professors. Yeah, I've heard of it. Heard of uh, and it, I yeah. tell them, well, you know what, there's a, there's a, in the LA County Library, they got a full set of it. Yeah. They're not even curious. You know, I never taught Chicano studies. I taught I taught uh, people in Chicano studies would take my course. I was there because I gave the Aztec course yeah. and, at, at Yale for quite a few years. I had every Chicano at Yale <laughs> at one point in my classes. Uh, uh, the guy who ran it uh, at Yale <laughs> wanted nothing to do with me or with Sahagun or with <laughs> the Aztecs. It's totally uninterested, totally uninterested. Yeah. Well, that, that's kind of the, the irony for us is we end up with wonderful people like, like yourself with a passion and love for, for this history. But when our own people get into it, it, they become just academics. There's no passion for it. It's, it's a tenure, it's a paycheck. It's that's right. It's just because you're a professor doesn't mean you know anything. I found that out. Can we quote you on this? <laughs> yeah, you can quote. You know, only my, my biological clocks are running out now. Yeah, no, no, we're, as you we're, know, I'm. Yeah, no, we're, we're trying to squeeze as much as we can. <laughs> he, already, he already said, we only got uh, 20 minutes left anyway on uh, tape. Yeah. Well, well, doctor, thank you very much. You're welcome, Oli. It's, it's always good to talk to you. Thank you, and, and uh, whenever you're out here yeah. again, let us know, and we'll yeah. try to get you on a. On a less uh, slap happy uh, day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm slap happy. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, doctor. Yeah. You guys okay. Fine.